Welcome to our third annual Future of US-China Conference. Our first year, we were at Stanford, the second year at the Computer History Museum. And this year, we're on Zoom. With this virtual format, we have an incredible and incredibly packed lineup for you. Our program with the agenda and speaker bios is in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. We are ready for nearly eight hours of live programming. Our highlight today is a tribute to Secretary George Shultz this afternoon. Do take a look at that program. We received several personal messages for him about all of his contributions over his 100 year lifespan. We have 1,400 people signed up for today, including ambassadors, consul generals, business leaders, our board, our global trustees, and press. We are on the record and we are recording. So let's get straight to it. To kick us off, welcome back to California Lieutenant Governor Eleni Koulinakis, who joins us for the second time during this COVID pandemic. She bravely joined us in early April, three weeks after shelter in place at our Game Changers West Gala. Lieutenant Governor, welcome back. Thank you, Margaret. I'm delighted to be here with the Asia Society of Northern California, and I'm grateful to you for the invitation to open this very timely and important conference on US-China relations. I'm also thrilled to be here with my friend and fellow San Franciscan, Secretary of State George Schultz. Mr. Secretary, very few have served our country with greater dedication, distinction, and wisdom than you. Congratulations on this well-deserved honor. Two years ago, soon after we both took office, Governor Newsom asked if I would also serve as California's representative for international affairs and trade. The governor and I both recognized the importance of elevating California's voice on the world stage to promote our state's values and help advance our interests. Over these last two years, three top priorities for our international engagement have emerged. And they are all very relevant when it comes to our sub subnational relationship with China. They are climate change, immigration, and trade. I'd like to touch very briefly on all three. When the Trump administration announced its withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord in 2017, California stepped up our efforts to lead on the climate agenda. My first official trip abroad in April 2019 was to Beijing where I represented California at the Belt and Road Conference. I was there for the singular purpose of urging China to adopt climate change as a top priority within BRI. California's partnership with China on, on environmental issues has been built over decades on the simple premise that every government should want to deliver clean air, clean water, and a healthy environment for their people. In the last decade alone, California has signed over 20 agreements with Chinese provinces and ministries. And each year we engage in countless technical exchanges with our Chinese counterparts. In 2019 alone, the California Energy Commission hosted over 70 international delegations, 60% of which came from Asia. Now with the new administration on its way in Washington DC, California will continue our work on the climate agenda and we look forward to the Biden-Harris administration stepping back in to take the lead. On the issue of immigration, policies set by the federal government have an outsized impact on California. 27% of our population is foreign born. We have over 3.3 million green card holders here and the most H-1B visa recipients in the country. In 2019, over 161,000 foreign students attended our world-class public and private universities, and 42% of them were from China. That same year, about 1.8 million Chinese visitors came to California, spending $4 billion that flowed into our economy. Here also, we are looking forward to Biden-Harris administration policies on immigration, which recognize the many benefits, social and economic, of comprehensive, humane immigration policies. And finally, a quick word on trade. For years, California has ranked first in the country in exports and first in foreign direct investment. 40% of all containerized cargo entering the US comes through California ports. While California exports are down about 12% this year, we believe it has less to do with the COVID-19 pandemic and more to do with the last administration's tariff disputes with China. 
putting pressure on countries to change uncompetitive trade policies is necessary, truly. But we are hopeful that the incoming Biden administration, Biden-Harris administration, will engage in a more constructive and comprehensive policies that will help California businesses sell more electric vehicles, manufactured goods, wine, cheese, and tree nuts, not just to China, but throughout Asia and beyond. Let me just conclude with one final thought. There are very few global geopolitical subjects that are more pressing today on the eve of the inauguration of President Biden and Vice President Harris than the topic of this conference. I believe it's fair to say that how the United States chooses to interact with China moving forward is the key question that will shape global international relations in the 21st century. And as US policy towards China evolves, California will almost certainly experience the impacts disproportionately to the rest of the country. We will be watching. So thank you to Asia Society for facilitating these discussions and to all of today's speakers for sharing your insights and wisdom. Thank you, Margaret. Lieutenant Governor, climate, immigration, and trade will do programs on all of those important topics. Let us know how we can help you. And we thank you for your support of Asia Society speaking to us again for the second time during this pandemic. And thank you for all that you do for California. Now, a few words from our new global president and CEO of Asia Society, the 26th Prime Minister of Australia, Kevin Rudd. He joins us pre-recorded from Australia. This is his first public address as CEO. Let's go to Kevin. Well, greetings from the Asia Society uh, in New York. I'm Kevin Rudd. I'm president and CEO, also president of the Asia Society Policy Institute, our think and do tank, where a lot of our attention is focused on the future of US-China relations. That's why I'm uh, pleased that our Northern California Centre, under the able leadership of uh, both Margaret and Ken, have uh, brought together this important conference on the future of US-China relations. I see also that uh, on our conference program we have contributions both from Henry Kissinger and George Shultz. I'm pleased to count uh, Henry Kissinger as a friend and as a colleague. And not only is he a distinguished American, of course he is a distinguished global statesman. And uh, in 2021 uh, we will celebrate uh, 50 years uh, since Henry's um, path-breaking secret diplomacy uh, towards uh, Beijing back in 1971. Needless to say, a lot has happened in 50 years. And as for George Shultz, another distinguished American and distinguished statesman, I remember well when as uh, Foreign Minister of Australia, I presented George with um, an order uh, of the uh, membership of the Order of Australia. Uh, an honorary membership which we extend to uh, foreign nationals. And that's because of George's extraordinary contribution to not just international diplomacy, but the diplomacy of the Asia Pacific, and of course, from an Australian perspective, uh, his engagement with our country over such a long period of time. And it's been my privilege and pleasure to spend time with him since then uh, in my new Asia Society capacity uh, at uh, Stanford University, uh, where he continues to exert an influence on future policy debates uh, for the United States of America. The subject which I have been uh, given to address today is um, what now for the global chessboard? What now for the future of US-China relations? So in the next uh, 15 or 20 minutes, I'd like to set out doing two or three things. One, um, speak uh, about what is likely to be Xi Jinping's approach to the Biden administration. Two, what the Biden administration may have as its own national strategy towards Xi Jinping's China. And three, is there a possibility of some form of uh, restabilization uh, of the relationship through what I often describe as a joint strategic framework? or what I've just written elsewhere as meaning a, uh, an approach entitled managed strategic competition. To begin with, um, when we look at uh, Xi Jinping's view of the world and uh, his view of the United States in particular, 
there are two animating principles uh, for uh, the exercise of Chinese uh, authority and influence in the world today, including in relation to the United States. Uh, one of those, of course, is the changing nature of the balance of power, which Xi Jinping has interpreted as moving decisively, increasingly decisively, in China's direction, both economically, technologically, and militarily. Uh, and the 2020s looms as a critical decade where many of those indicators will move, in his view, more decisively in China's direction. And the second animating factor in causing changes in Chinese policy behaviour, both now and in the decade which lies ahead, is uh, Xi Jinping's own leadership style. Xi Jinping is not a cautious, conservative Chinese political leader of the old school. He's prepared to take risks. He's prepared to push the envelope. He's prepared to occupy vacuums when he has identified those as having been presented or created by any American withdrawal from one part of the world or the other, or one part of the global architecture or the other. And we've certainly seen evidence of that over the last four years of the Trump administration. So when we seek to analyse how Xi Jinping will approach the Biden administration, we need to be very clear about these two fundamental driving forces uh, which uh, are animating uh, the direction of China's foreign policy, its strategic policy, its international economic policy, as well as, frankly, its domestic economic policy settings and its domestic politics. So therefore, based on uh, those assumptions, how do we anticipate uh, Xi Jinping uh, will approach the new Biden administration. First, I think, consistent with previous Chinese administrations, there will be a long strategic pause of some several months as the uh, Chinese administration seeks to form an assessment as to what substantive as opposed to rhetorical changes uh, will be brought about under Biden towards China. Uh, the Chinese, since uh, Henry Kissinger's first visit, have been keen students of US presidential politics. They understand loud and clear the difference between what candidates say in the context of a US presidential election race and what then is translated through in the real policies of an administration. And rightly or wrongly, what the Chinese have deduced over the last 50 years is there is a considerable gap between the two. Also, the Chinese system, populated by a hardy breed of Marxist-Leninists, will take a very long, hard, materialist view as to what materially changes in US actual operational behaviour towards China under the Biden administration. For example, what will the United States now do as far as its operational patterns of behaviour in the South China Sea and across the Taiwan Straits? What will the new administration do as far as future levels of official contact with Taipei be concerned? Uh, what will now happen in terms of US foreign policy directions on critical questions such as human rights, Xinjiang, Hong Kong, uh, and more broadly? Thirdly, they'll be observing carefully what happens now with the future of the bilateral trade deal uh, between the Trump administration uh, and uh, Xi Jinping's China. Will there be a phase two negotiation or will there, won't, or will there not be? Uh, and on top of that, will the current tariff regime remain in place? And beyond that, the beginnings of the imposition of a range of restrictions and sanctions on the finance sector the listing of Chinese corporations on US stock exchanges and a range of other foreshadowed restrictions concerning the investment patterns of, China, of American pension funds in Chinese equities. And of course, on top of all of that, there'll be an assessment of what happens in technology markets as well. Will there be a change on this front or will there not be a change? Uh, will the uh, fundamental disputes which arose between the United States and Huawei during the period of the Trump administration continue and expand, or will they not? The reason I go through this list at some length is to make it plain that from Xi Jinping's perspective and those who advise him, their razor-sharp lens will be on what materially changes in each of these domains, and much less so what the United States says in its own domestic political debate 
um, may be changing or may change further in the future. That, I think, is principle number one. Principle number two for Xi Jinping's approach to the Biden administration uh, will be uh, how, in fact, uh, to handle the most fundamentally sensitive question of all, which is the future of Taiwan. I touched on this before. The Trump administration um, began to tread on very dangerous ground um, by opening up a much wider range of official contact between the United States government and the government of Tsai Ing-wen uh, in Taipei. We've seen this, of course, uh, through official visits by US cabinet secretaries uh, to Taiwan. Uh, we have seen it in a range of other domains as well. And so uh, the number one concern on the part of uh, Xi Jinping's uh, administration uh, will be how does it induce the Biden administration into adopting a posture on the One China policy which is more consistent uh, with what we've seen in the past. Third, um, the uh, ad administration of Xi Jinping, as far as Biden is concerned, will take a, an overall long-term view uh, that the overall structure of the US-China relationship is unlikely to change a lot. And what that means is that they will seek to ensure uh, that China is as prepared as possible uh, to avoid any unnecessary damage uh, to their own national interests as, as a consequence of a continuation of those already existing policy directions. So in concrete terms, what does that mean? If we look carefully at uh, what Xi Jinping has done on economic policy, on economic policy with the enunciation during the course of 2020 of his so-called dual circulation economy. What he means by that is an economy where in the future they will seek to have the main drivers of China's future economic growth come from China's domestic consumer demand rather than what will necessarily be earned from net exports abroad including its number one export market the United States. But of course, Xi Jinping's so-called dual circulation economy is a much broader concept as well. In fact, it's code language for various forms of national self-reliance. Self-reliance in terms of being less dependent on foreign exports, as I just said, but also less reliance on foreign countries for the critical supply of uh, essential inputs to the Chinese industrial process. And of course, the poster child for all that is what then happens on the future of China's own high-tech future. This is critically important uh, for China's future because it goes down to the essential world of microchips and can China be self-reliant in microchips in the future. This of course is of uh, direct relevance to the future of the semiconductor industry in the United States and that is particularly relevant to your part of the world in California and in Silicon Valley. But uh, Xi Jinping's overall perspective is that greater national self-reliance across uh, all economic uh, categories, most particularly high technology, uh, is necessary against what they judge to be a long-term structural deterioration in the US-China relationship. There's one other factor I'll mention as well in terms of Xi Jinping's overall strategy. And that is, as he anticipates that the structural relationship with the United States particularly on economic engagement, will get worse. At the same time, uh, Xi Jinping uh, will be seeking to maximise new economic openings in the rest of Asia and new economic openings in Europe and the other major markets of the world. So uh, that's why we have seen a flurry of activity from Beijing in the development of uh, the uh, RCEP uh, free trade arrangement with 15 East Asian economies towards the end of 2020. And then uh, on New Year's Eve, uh, the remarkable announcement of a new bilateral investment agreement between China and the European Union. Although the latter still has to negotiate its way through the ratification processes of the European Parliament, and that may be far from smooth. But the reason I mention those at this stage is because these underline the extent to which Xi Jinping um, is seeking to insulate China in its access to export markets, investment markets, capital markets and technology markets 
and even talent markets to insulate his country from what they anticipate will be uh, an increasingly negative trend in the US-China relationship by opening up uh, China's uh, market opportunities to the rest of the world, including the rest of the developed world. One final point about Xi Jinping's strategy is, uh, is this. Xi Jinping's strategy, as we've seen recently in terms of the punitive economic measures taken against Australia, and recently other punitive measures against countries like Canada, Japan, South Korea, and in Europe, Sweden, Norway, much earlier on the Netherlands, uh, is that China's overall strategy will continue to be to send a loud message across the world that if any individual country less powerful than China dares to cross China's national interests uh, by articulating a foreign policy direction or a human rights direction or an economic policy direction or a strategic posture vis-a-vis -vis the South China Sea, which is in conflict with China's uh, own national strategy, then China will have no qualms whatsoever about leveraging its economic power in order to send a clear message to that country and to other countries around the world. The Chinese Chongyu, or four character phrase, is Sha Yi Jing Bai, kill one to warn a hundred. And that's very much at work. Of course, um, at the end of the day, um, China still will have to uh, prosecute a strategy which it receives a level of acceptance on the part of its neighbouring states and across the principal institutions of global political and economic and climate change governments. And that's where I should conclude. For national reasons in China itself, China will also wish to open up lines of climate change uh, policy dialogue with the new Biden administration as they have sustained and are now intensifying with the Europeans. Uh, and therefore, a challenge for the Biden administration will be how to engage this climate change track with China on the one hand, while recognising in the other tracks of the relationship, uh, there will be a much more competitive and in some areas adversarial relationship. So therefore, there are some reflections on Xi Jinping's overall strategy towards the Biden administration. Now what about the Biden response? Uh, far be it from me to speak on behalf of the incoming administration. I have no brief to do so. And it's very early days yet. But here are a couple of quick observations. Number one, the Biden administration, I believe, will be aware that for the first time the United States of America needs a coherent and to the greatest extent possible bipartisan national China strategy, which incorporates all elements of American national power, not just classical foreign policy, not just the usual positions taken on human rights, but across strategic policy, including the military, technology, uh, the economy, trade, investment, and the rest. Number two, the Biden administration is also likely to be aware of the fact that because of the changing nature of the balance of power between the US and China, including in East Asia and the West Pacific, that for the first time since 1945, America will fundamentally need its principal allies, both in Asia and Europe, to maintain a balance of power advantage in relation to China, uh, rather than simply seeing its allies as an occasional encumbrance or uh, something which may be seen to be superficially diplomatically useful and what's always been described in diplomacy as a full flags exercise. That won't work anymore. Uh, China at present is on track to become a larger economy in GDP measured in market exchange rate terms uh, by 2028. That's only eight years from now. Uh, the COVID factor and the COVID recovery timetables of both countries has accelerated that crossover point. So in pure economic terms, before you go to the subcomponents of trade volume, investment volume and intensity and direction, technology capabilities, etc., as well as capital markets, currency markets, the United States will need to craft a national China strategy which becomes the basis for a pan-allied strategy with its principal allies in Asia and in Europe. That does not mean with every country, and when I say principal allies, that's likely to be where it goes. In Asia, countries like, obviously, Japan, the Republic of Korea and Australia, possibly India, though it is not a treaty ally, but becoming closer strategically to the United States. And in Europe, countries like, obviously, the United Kingdom, France, Germany, 
even the European Union itself, Canada and North America, and if we are casting the net wider beyond formal treaty allies, than to countries like Mexico, Indonesia and India I've already mentioned. Um, the question of Africa also looms large. A third element uh, of uh, a Biden strategy towards dealing with uh, China will be how to deal with the Chinese strategy of isolating and punishing individual allies. At present, Australia is the poster child for this, uh, but it will soon pass to other countries as well. And this will become uh, a fundamental test and challenge for the Biden administration in how it goes about conveying the message to Beijing that it is not going to stand idly by while its treaty allies uh, are treated in such a man manner. Fourth, as I indicated before, Joe Biden and the Democrats are deeply committed to the future of climate change action. And you cannot achieve progress on climate change unless the world's two largest emitters, China and the United States, are not just talking with each other, but negotiating with each other and creating the critical leverage necessary to achieve a wider global outcome in terms of the level of greenhouse gas emissions to be achieved globally, as well as the national actions which need to underpin that. I believe, therefore, there will be a possibility uh, within the framework of continued uh, collaboration with Beijing for there to be uh, an active climate change dialogue between the two capitals uh, beyond the superficial. In fact, prior to this um, most recent election, we at the Asia Society have been intimately involved in those dialogues between the Chinese and the Americans about what could happen in the future. So there are some quick reflections on how the Biden administration may respond to Xi Jinping's China. Finally, let me conclude with this. Are we simply spiralling towards a future direction which is one of uh, ever-intensifying strategic competition uh, with the ever-present risk of that escalating into crisis, conflict or even war? Or is there a different approach? I'm very mindful of the presence at this uh, particular conference of uh, genuinely wise men, uh, Henry Kissinger and George Schultz. Uh, who are old enough and experienced enough to remember acutely the lessons from the Cold War against the Soviet Union. We're not in a Cold War with China and perish the thought that we will end up in one. But one of the lessons from the Cold War was how, after the near-death experience of the Cuban Missile Crisis in the 1960s, uh, both countries decided to have about them a mutually agreed set of strategic understandings which prevented these countries from sliding into the nuclear abyss during the rest of the 60s, the 70s and the 80s. Therefore, the relationship now between China and the United States is nowhere as fundamentally adversarial as what we had between the then Soviet Union and the United States. Uh, there are vast differences between that Cold War and what we now have with China not least because of the high degree of economic interdependence between Beijing and Washington still. But there is a place for high diplomacy to deliver what I describe as a framework of managed strategic competition, a joint strategic framework. What do I mean by that? An understanding between the two capitals about what the fundamental red lines in each capital really are, both on Taiwan, the South China Sea, and elsewhere, including the future of cyber security as well. Uh, it's important that there is a high degree of clarification as to what those red lines are in the private diplomatic domain, so that if they are breached, the other sides know, the other side will know that consequences will flow. Second, that opens up a vast area of potentiality for, let's call it, managed strategic competition across foreign policy, across the economy, trade, investment, technology and the rest, and the great global competition for ideas between China's form of authoritarian capitalism versus uh, the liberal democratic norms which are fundamental to the United States and the other liberal democracies of, uh, of the world today. And therefore, in the midst of that strategic competition, both in the economy and in politics and in foreign policy, as well as in technology and basic questions of ideology, um, May the best man or woman win. Um, as the Chinese would say, let a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend. And finally, within this framework of strategic competition or managed strategic competition, there is also room and space for collaboration and cooperation in areas like 
climate change, in areas like pandemic management, in areas like global financial market stability, particularly given the likely impact of uh, the flow through of high levels of public sector and private sector debt onto global debt markets and the need therefore to ensure longer term global financial stability. Myself having been an office during the last global financial crisis, I know how easily and quickly it is for these things to manifest and how critical it is to have effective global machinery through the G20 for example to ensure that we do not tip into a financial crisis abyss. And so there are three sets of, of reflections. One about what is likely to be uh, the core elements of uh, Xi Jinping's approach to the incoming Biden administration uh, during the course of 2021. A few reflections on how Biden may seek to respond. And an argument towards both capitals uh, based on work I've done in the past and have circulated uh, to both governments on this concept of a joint strategic framework, a framework of managed strategic competition, which enables there to be a vigorous competitive and at times cooperative relationship, but without running the daily risk of sliding into escalation, crisis, conflict and war. I thank you for your time. Astute insights there from Kevin, and we welcome him as our new CEO.